What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another edition of Baseball Central. As always, I'm John Check, and today we're here to talk about some of the craziness that ensued over this past week uh, in baseball, mainly about the San Diego Padres. AJ Preller and the rest of the Padres brain trust, uh, brain, brain trust, excuse me, just went absolutely nuts this week. Uh, the Padres last year, a lot of people were considering them a sleeper squad to potentially make a playoff spot. With the pitching that they have, and you know, you, you look at the depth of rotation and some of the bullpen pieces they had, it wasn't out of the realm to think that they possibly could be a playoff team, especially considering uh, in 2012, you look at their, or 2013, excuse me, you look at their second half, they're nearly a 500 squad. Well, last year, the, uh, the Padres had the third worst offense in the last 20 years, the third fewest amount of score, runs scored since 1994. Historically bad. Their offense, there was only one guy, one guy that had over 50 RBIs on an entire team, and that was Jed Jerko. And Jerko didn't even play a full season. They didn't have anyone hit over more than 15 home runs. I mean, they had a couple of guys in double-digit home runs, but that was about it. Their offense was terrible, 535 runs scored. They had a negative 42 run differential with a pitching staff that only allowed 577 runs. So A.J. Preller, when he took over, uh, as uh, for Omar Minaya, made it clear that the Padres were looking to maybe spend some money this offseason and, you know, put a team on the field that could compete in 2015, you know, give these guys some kind of runs to work with. You know, uh, the Padres, they've been the last few years been a bad offensive squad. I mean, they play in a big park like Petco. They've tried moving in the fences. You know, it's helped some. But, you know, their, their team just they don't have that star power. Well, what do the Padres go out and do? So far this offseason, they went out and they, they traded for Matt Kemp. They traded for Will Myers, they traded for Justin Upton, and they traded for Will Middlebrooks. Now they have a team on the field that can potentially score some runs, be a decent offensive squad. So let's start with all these moves. First off, the Matt Kemp trade. I absolutely love the Matt Kemp trade. Now look, I know what Matt Kemp brings, and I know he what injury history has as well. But when you're a team that can't afford a guy like Matt Kemp, and they're going to give you $32 million bucks, to make his annual average value $15 million per year for the remainder of his contract, that's an absolute steal. You get a star power guy, some guy with a name besides, you know, Alexi Amarista or Seth Smith or Cameron Mabin or, you know, there's just not any guy, Everth Cabrera. I mean, there, there's really been no superstars in San Diego since Adrian Gonzalez really over the last few years. Now you have a guy that people are going to come out to the ballpark and see. And you got Matt Kemp who had his first really, really good season since his MVP season. Now, mind you, keep in mind that his stats, if you look at his second half compared to his first half, he really came on in the second half. The first half really wasn't that great. He's actually benched for a little bit. He actually wasn't even starting for a short while there because he had a little bit of a disagreement there with Don Maddenly about where he was going to play. He felt he should play center field. Uh, Don Maddenly felt otherwise, and he actually made the comment that if he wanted to play center field, it wouldn't be for the Dodgers. So that was that. But – you know, Kemp, he showed the ability to finally stay healthy. And this trade, mind you, almost did not go through because they found arthritis in Matt Kemp's hip. But Kemp and, uh, you know, Kemp said that his hip feels fine. I guess the doctors ruled that it's not something too, too serious or the trade wouldn't have went through. It wouldn't become official. But I liked it because you get a guy that's got a star power. He brings in – it's almost like when the Mariners, they went out and they shelled out. Hey, look how much they had to shell for Robinson Cano. Why? Because they had no one there. No one. That wanted to bring people uh, to, to bring people to the ballpark to make players go look. We want to come play here. So what do they do? They spend all this egregious money on Robinson Cano, but now they have a superstar in the lineup. Now they have a player who goes look. This team's out here. They're signing Robinson Cano. They're spending all this money on him, and they're going to try to build a team around him. We know what they got in the rotation: Neil Kuma and King Felix and Tywin Walker and James Paxton. We know what they offer in the bullpen, and now look what they do. Now it's not as hard to get free agents to come to that park because most of the time, you know, it used to be free agents. Well, I don't want to go there. I mean, that's where, where players go to die. If they got Robinson Cano now, look, Nelly Cruz comes on board now. Now you got Robinson Cano there. And people are like, okay, you know, maybe this might be a place to play. They're doing something there. Now you look, they got Matt Kemp. You know, we got some, we got a superstar power guy. They got a guy that's a legitimate, you know, top 10 player in baseball when healthy. Now, that is the biggest question mark when healthy. If Matt Kemp does not stay healthy because this lineup is going to revolve around him, he's going to be the big bat in the middle of the order. If he does not stay healthy, this could go bad pretty quick for the Padres. But you got to hope he can replicate what he did in the second half with the uh, with the Dodgers. And like I said, with Robinson Cano with Seattle, 
Now they got a star player in there. They got a, you know, and, and now you look at the Will Myers, and now you look at you look at Will Middlebrooks and Justin Upton. They got some names. So you know, maybe signing some free agents, guys are gonna go well. You know, hitters especially. Well, I don't want to go hit there. It's a it's a big park. You know, there's not really anyone there. They don't have a chance to contend. No, the Padres do have a chance to contend, and we're gonna get on to that here in a minute. Looking at Will Myers, you know, he's coming off a year where he was hurt. You know, you, you hurt his wrist. He didn't really even come close to replicating his numbers he had as a rookie, which were outstanding. I mean, this was a guy I don't think he even played 110 games as a rookie. And he went rookie of the year, and he came up, showed flashes of his power, you know. But he is a guy that does strike out quite a bit. He is a young raw hitter. And you got to think, those the numbers he had last year, those were fluke. You, he's, he, you give him a healthy season, the power's going to come down fine. He's playing at Petco, so be it. But – you look at a guy, he's got gap-to-gap -gap power. He's a good hitter. Once he learns a little bit more plate discipline, he's going to be an all-around player. And it's a great move because the Padres get a, a team-controlled, young, cost-effective guy for the next few years. So you got Kemp for the next few years. you got Myers for the next few years. And he's more extremely cost-effective and team-controlled. So that's a win for Preller on that one. And then you look at acquiring Justin Upton. Justin Upton is a free agent to be. But... You get a guy legit power back. He's playing at Turner Field, not an easy park to hit bombs in, and he put out, you know, nearly 30 home runs the last two years in a row. So, you know, he's going to go to Petco. I think the number's going to drop down to probably about 20 to 23 home runs. I would say so. And there, even though he, you know, he's had some long home runs, Petco. This is a guy that played for Arizona, so he's very familiar with uh, the ballpark, that's for sure. But – He's had some long home runs there, and his power turns like, well, anywhere. But I think his power is going to come down a little bit. But now you got a guy. Mind, I think he's probably only going to stay in San Diego for the year because he's a free agent to be. But now you got a guy to back up Matt Kemp. You know, you're not going, well, Will Myers is fine, but he's not really a guy who can really back up Matt Kemp. Who's going to be a middle-of-the-order thumper? Upton fits that role perfectly. And Preller right now has done a good job at assembling this roster. With names that are high priced names, the Kemps and the Uptons. And really, it's small market because uh, Upton's contract is pretty team friendly this year. And considering you don't got him locked up long term, so long, a lot of money long term. So the money comes off the books quickly. What you do got tied up this year, Matt Kemp, you get a huge discount to what the Dodgers are going to be paying him. As I said with Myers, you know, you get a guy, team controlled, a lot of upside, having for a lot of number of years. Justin Upton, I absolutely love. Does he sign there? I don't know. Maybe not. There is, as you know, rumors going around that Upton was thinking about signing an extension long term in San Diego, but I don't see any chance with the way free agency is nowadays and guys going out of the free market and they they just want to get bidded on. Is all it is. You know, you stay with your team, you don't have twenty nine other teams sitting there offering you money. You just don't. So the the amount of money that you can command goes down. John Lester, perfect example. Red Sox off from five and seventy in spring training. He's like, no, I'm going to pitch. I'm going to hit the free agent market. Let teams bid on me. That goes up almost double, over double. He gets, what, 7 and 155, 6 and 155. So that's why I think Upton's going to hit the free agent market. But great job by Preller to get a legit middle of the other bat to back up Kemp. It's just not, you know, a one, a one punch monkey in that lineup. It's, you know, you got some thump. Then you get Will Middlebrooks to replace Chase Headley. And you got uh, Salarte as well. He could play some third, but he'll probably play some second as well. Uh, Salarte will. And Middlebrooks is a guy that he came up as a rookie in front, and he just he looked good. The Red Sox are like, okay, you know, we lose Kevin Euclid's injury. We finally got our answer, Will Middlebrooks. So what's Will Middlebrooks do? He was good his rookie year. Then the last two years he's faced injury. He's faced some adversity. He was so bad he had to get sent down to the minors. But you take a shot at him. You didn't give up too much to get him. Another guy, young, cost-controlled, team, you know, cost -control, team-friendly contract. See what happens. He could be, uh, you know, he could be a solution there. If not, you can move on from him. He's not going to hurt you too much with the wallet wise. But I still like the depth he has in the lineup. Um, so now I move on to the point of are the Padres contenders? And absolutely, they are contenders. And here's why: as I stated before, the Padres last year only scored 535 runs. Third fewest amount of runs scored in baseball since 1994, the year of the strike. Only. 577 runs given up. Last year, only the Oakland A's. Oakland A's, that's it. Surrendered less runs given up at 572. Five fewer runs in the San Diego Padres. And you're looking, really? A staff that had Samarja, Lester, Hamill, Sonny Gray, uh, Drew Pomerantz was in there a little bit, was really good. Jesse Chavez was in there for a little bit, was really good. I mean, you had a staff of, of great people, not to mention how good their bullpen was. I mean, guys like Gregerson and Sean Doolittle and Abad. I mean, they had some guys in there to get some outs. That was their strong point. Only the Padres had 
less runs or only the Padres had five fewer runs given up than them. That's it. Five fewer runs. So with 535 runs scored, 577 given up, like I said, that equals out to a negative 42 run differential. You score less runs than you than you give up, you know, you're not gonna win. It's just simple math. I mean, there is times where you have negative run differential and a positive record. It's hard to do, but it's happened. So my point is, if you look at the top four offenses in baseball last year, based on run differential, it was the Dodgers, the A's, the the the, the Angels, and the fourth one is slipping my mind, the Nationals. If you put those guys, though, that team, those teams' offenses on the on the Padres, and I wrote an article about this on BaseballCentral.com. You guys can go read it, but I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. If they had the A's offense, they would have had the second best run differential in baseball last year, and it was at like a plus 151. They had the Angels offense. They would have had a plus 191 run differential last year. If they would have had the Nationals offense, they would have had like a plus 100. And if they would have had the Dodgers offense, they would have had a plus 141 run differential. Now, I know what you're saying. Fine. You can say that about a lot of teams. You know, they had a good pitching staff, but they had an offense. You give them this, or blah, 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 blah. But, but listen, with these additions that they added to their lineup, that's an extra almost 400 runs between those four guys. Their entire 25-man roster of players only scored 535. The four guys that they added at 422. So now you get all these guys, you add them onto the Padres, you give them an extra 422 runs instead of those two guys, and that's with Myers having a bad year and Middlebrooks being an, an absolute you know, lost cause. Still that many runs. Now, just say you gave him an average offense, okay? This is how good the Padres were last year. This is why I think they can be a contender. If eight players on their team had 13 more RBIs, just eight players, that would have given them 104 more runs, which would have made their run differential go up to a plus 62 on the year. Now, now stay with me here. This is why this is important, why I think the Padres can contend. 13 more RBIs out of eight players on that roster, plus 62 run differential. Here's teams with the same kind of run differential at plus 62. The Detroit Tigers were at a plus 52 last year. The Royals, American League champions, were at a plus 27. The Cardinals, 27. Pittsburgh Pirates, plus 51. San Francisco Giants, your world champions, people, at a plus 51 run differential. Just th And what do all these teams have in common? They're either World Series champs in San Francisco, American League champs and Royals. Both the Tigers and Cardinals and Pirates all made the playoffs. Just 13 more extra RBIs out of eight players on that team at a plus 62 run differential with that pitching staff. That takes their 77 win record and boosts them up to well over a 500 club. A team that's competing for a second wild card spot. A team that was a potential playoff team. Now you had all these guys with that pitching staff that they featured, a pitching staff that's going to still have uh, Andrew Kashner, still going to have Tyson Ross. They're bringing back Brandon. They're bringing in Brandon Morrow. They're bringing back Josh Johnson to see if he can actually throw pitches a Padre this time. With those new guys, they could easily contend for that division. Easily. The, the Dodgers, have, yeah, they got Howie Kendrick and the Jimmy Rollins trade finally went through, and I know they got Adrian Gonzalez and they got up weak, but Andre Ethier is not that good. Carl Crawford's always hurt. The Dodgers, actually, their pitching staff with Grinky, with Kershaw, with Ryu, with Brian Wilson and Kenley Jansen and Chris Perez and all those guys, they still gave up more runs than the Padres pitching staff. The Padres pitching staff was actually better than the Dodgers pitching staff last year. And that's a pitching staff that cost almost half as less. So they've taken a step back. The Giants, they got Casey McGee to replace uh, Pablo Sandoval, fine, whatever. That's a push. McGee had, you know, a, a comeback player of the year, but how is he going to do next year, you know, coming back off it? I mean, this guy was so bad, he had to go to Japan to rectify his career. Their rotation is still kind of a lost cause. I mean, they brought – Tim Hudson was good last year, but how can he – he's going to be good again this year. He's getting older. They brought back Jake Peavy. You know, can Matt Cain ever look like himself? Madison Bumgarner is a beast. I'll give you that, you know. Uh, and Tim Lutz comes a shell of himself. So who knows there? You don't got to worry about the Diamondbacks, really. I mean, I know they're coming back healthy, and they, they, they made some moves. But I don't think they're going to be a contender. And then the Rockies, they don't have any pitching. 
There is no reason why the Padres, with these new acquisition acquisitions, could not compete next year for the NL West. This division, I mean, they are good teams finding the Dodgers and Giants, but the Padres, with just 13 more RBIs from all their from eight players, would have had almost the same run differential as the Giants. A team, mind you, that won 88 games last year with that run differential. Now, don't get me wrong, run differential is not the be-all, end-all. I'm just making the point of how bad their offense was, and now you had Kemp, now you had Upton, now you had Myers, now you had Derek Norris. I forgot Derek Norris in this too. My bad, my bad. Derek Norris was a part of the guys that will contribute for it. With the new acquisitions they got, he would have been a part of the 422 runs. Excuse me. You got Derek Norris and Will Middlebrooks. You added onto a squad with the second, according to run differential, gave up the second fewest amount of runs in baseball, only by five. Come on now. How could you not think the San Diego Padres could not contend for the NL West? With the steps the Dodgers have taken back this year, trading away Kemp and all that, and the Giants with their, some of their holes they still have, and as good as the Padres were last year, uh, the pitching staff was last year, you add some offense, you got legit guys there now. They could easily, easily contend for this division next year. And if you don't think they are at least a wild card contender now, I'm sorry. You're nuts. You're just absolutely nuts. The Padres this year, I love what A.J. Preller has done. I am drinking the Padres Kool-Aid. I got it all over everywhere. I got all the sugar in there. I'm chugging it. I'm pumped. I'm pumped. I'm hyped. I'm all in on the Padres. This year, they will be an over 500 squad. You give them, like I said, with the run differential, you give them a better offense last year. They were in the playoffs, so their pitching staff was that good. Just 13 more RBIs at eight out of all those eight players. And they had the same run differential as six playoff teams, or excuse me, five playoff teams. They could do something this year. Watch out for the Padres. All my point is good moves by Preller. Awesome job assembling that squad. Don't sleep on that team. Now, Moving on with a couple other moves, the Yankees had traded Martin Prado and David Phelps to the Miami Marlins for uh, Nathan Eovaldi. Now, Eovaldi is a guy that you know almost pitched 200 innings for the first time this year, but you look at Nathan Eovaldi's numbers here, which I'm going to pull up, and his strikeout rate really isn't that good. He only averaged about six strikeouts, 6.4 strikeouts per nine innings, but this is a guy that one of the hardest throwing pitchers in baseball. Really good slider. I mean, his, his changeup is absolutely terrible. I read an article on Fangraphs about this, and his changeup is not good. It's it's absolutely terrible. And they're comparing him to Garrett Richards for movement on the slider and the fastball and curveball. He actually compares really close, except Garrett Richards is a strikeout machine. Nathan Eovaldi, he's a guy who throws extremely hard, has a good slider and whatnot, but he gives up so many hits. And his strikeout rate for a guy who throws as hard as he does is not that great. But what the Yankees get in this is they get some much-needed young rotation depth and cost control. You spent all this money on Masahiro Tanaka last season, and this guy's UCL, you have no idea if you're going to get 180 innings out of this year because you're afraid it's going to pop and you got all that money sitting there. CC Zabathia, I- I'm sorry, guys. I'm Every year I've been saying this. Well, if the Yankees can get CC Zabathia to come back and look like he did, there's a chance the Yankees rotation will be good. He's not coming back. He's just not. I'm sorry. The man is about to be giving his mid-30s a hug. You know, he's a guy that's lost a lot of weight. And and that's a good thing. Yeah, fine. But it hurt his velocity. His velocity is not there. The secondary stuff doesn't look like it is. He's done. He's not going to be CC Sabathia ever again. Ever again. You know, you got Michael Pineda, but he was hurt last year. And, you know, he's getting suspended for having pine tar in his neck. Ivan Nova's coming off Tommy John surgery. They needed someone in this rotation that's going to give them innings. They needed someone in this rotation that's not going to cost them an arm and a leg. They're not going to go out and get Max Scherzer, Yankee fans. I'm sorry. They're not. So with this, you gave up Martin Prado, which I can't believe they did. You know, you, you, you don't have you have don't have a lot of depth really for guys like him that can play second, that can play third, that can play out. They'll use a quality bat at doing all this. He was versatile. So I don't know why you give up such a, a versatile piece for a young pitcher, now mind you, that like I said, they needed some kind of rotation depth that was cost-effective and young. But Prado was a really nice piece to give up. Now, David Phelps, I liked him as well. He's kind of up in the air with this guy. What's he going to be, you know, a, a reliever? Can he be a starter? Who knows? But I kind of thought the cost was kind of high for Nathan Eovaldi for, for Martin Prado. I thought the Yankees really should have kept him. I know they still got Chase Headley, but Martin Prado wouldn't have looked – too bad there at second base, and he wouldn't look too bad filling in the outfield need be. 
as, a, as an outfield depth either. So I don't know. I get where the Yankees are coming from. They needed some young pitch, and they needed someone that's going to give them innings. They needed someone young. They needed someone cost-effective. But I thought Prado was a bit of bit much to give up. I like him a lot. I think he's a gamer. Now, you look on the Marlins side of this. Oh, and they got Garrett Jones too, but Garrett Jones is terrible. There's no reason to touch on him. Um, you look on the Yankees side of this, um, or the, not the Yankees side, but the Miami Marlins side of this, you get Martin Prado to go along with D. Gordon, to go along with Matt Latos, and now you got – uh, you know, uh, Azuna's coming off a great year, and you got Stanton in there, and then you look at the rest of the rotation with Fernandez and Henderson Alvarez and Dan Heron. I mean, you got some nice pieces in place, and Jared Slovakia and Christian Yelich. You got some nice pieces in place. I have actually got to give Jeffrey Loria credit that they've actually they went out and they signed all this money to get to keep Stanton long term. Now there is some crookedness behind this contract. There's an article on baseballcentral.com you guys need to go check out about Jeffrey Loria's comments uh, that he made to Neil Huntington about this contract. So you need to go check that out. It was actually featured on, on MLB Trade Rumors. Check that out on baseball, uh, baseballcentral.com about the Giancarlo Stanton uh, contract situation. But that's that's another thing. You look at the Miami Marlins, though, they've assembled a sneaky good roster. Now, when they went a couple years back and tried to buy those guys like Heath Bell and Jose Reyes and Josh Johnson and Mark Burley. I was like, uh, or not Josh Johnson, but Mark Burley. I was like, you know, this doesn't work. You know, these guys, it, it's not what they need. And the roster failed and they ended up dealing everyone. But this roster with Matt Latos and Jose Fernandez and Henderson Alvarez and Miguel Ozuna and, and, and uh, Martin Prado and Salto Machia and Christian Yelich, I mean, they, they got some – some really, really nice players. And I think with the division, you know, the Nationals are coming back to the pack a little bit, I think. I don't I think they're gonna be I think they're gonna be the, the division favorites, but I think they've come back down just a slight bit. I think that with the Braves trading away everyone and the Phillies being a shell of themselves, and the Mets really don't know are they gonna compete. You know, the young pitching's good, but you know, they still need a shortstop. It was Michael Kadaya, really your off-field option. I think the Miami Marlins have a legitimate possibility of being a second wild card team this year. They have a very good rotation, and they were they were only a few games under 500 anyways, and they were over 500 a good chunk of the year. And that was minus Jose Fernandez, and that was minus Giancarlo Stanton for the last nearly month of the season. So you get him along with the rest of the guys that they've added. That is a sneaky, sneaky good move by the Marlins, and I like it a lot. And last but not least, to touch on some of these trades and deals that went down, Casey McGee got dealt over to the San Francisco Giants. Basically, this is a guy that was comeback player of the year uh, last year for the NL. And he's a guy who was really good at hitting your runners in scoring position. And he was a guy, I believe, let me let me check here. I got his statistics up. Yeah, he, he drove in 76 RBIs. So, I mean, he, he, was a, he was a run producer. He put up a 287, 355, 357 slash. Not bad at all. Had 102 weighted runs created. Was a two-win player. So he was a quality piece. But you look at some of his years prior, uh, he wasn't that good. You know, look at his last year on the Brewers in 2011. He only had 223. He got dealt over to the uh, to the Yankees uh, for a short while. He was in their minor league system. And he was so bad, he ended up having to go to Japan. Kind of, you know, re uh, revived his career some. But who knows? Can he put back back-to-back -back good seasons in a row? Who knows? But if you're the Giants, you didn't give up too, too much to get him. You take a risk on him, cheap replacement to Pablo Sandoval and whatnot. So it is what it is. And he can play some first base if uh, Brandon Bell gets hurt, to, uh, hurt again too. So there's, there's that positive there as well. But like I said, don't sleep on the Padres. Keep that run differential stats in mind. 13 RBIs, guys. 13 more RBIs out of eight players. And their run differential is comparable to five other postseason teams last year. Like, I see what the Yankees did with Nathan Eovaldi, but kind of steep price, I think, giving up Martin Prado. And with Casey McGee, cheap replacement for Pablo Sandoval. But you do what you got to do. You can also play some first base. Like I said, Brandon Bell can hurt. And you got to hope he has a, another good year. So, as always, check out BaseballCentral.com. Check us out on Twitter. And make sure you check out that Giancarlo Stanton article. You have to go check that out. What Jeffrey Lurie said to Neil Huntington about that contract is it's just mind blowing that he would say it to another GM, and it's 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 some crooked stuff. So check it out. So I'm John Check. Hope you enjoyed this video. Like I said, check out baseballcentral.com. Follow us on Twitter and all that good stuff. Have a good one, guys.